Okay, it's recording. Yes. Fine. Yes, very good. Uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, we have today uh, Matthew uh, with us. Uh, it's a great blessing. And um, looking forward for uh, the talk tonight, uh, to be rooted in communion, Eucharist. Um, and um, uh, to, for our spiritual life, for our growth, um, may God bless you and give you uh, a word of wisdom through his Holy Spirit. Uh, God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Abuna. So before I start, if I switch my screens, does it um, only show the PowerPoint or will it show my notes as well? So now I can see your PowerPoint. Okay, you can only yeah, see the PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. That works out good for me. Okay, so like Abuna mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a life rooted in communion, an orthodox perspective on spirituality and spiritual life. Now, when I went to name this, I had some difficulty in naming the, uh, um, the talk for tonight because the talk on spirituality, I want to say it's, it's somewhat of a new perspective, but when I put the word new, it didn't really follow to say it's new because the church focuses so heavily on apostolic tradition and everything that's passed down from the fathers. So I can assure you that whatever I'm going to say is um, correct, orthodox, and, and it will follow apostolic tradition, but it might be new to you um, just because of the way we've deviated in talking about spirituality these days. Um, and this whole talk is based on a book called For the Life of the World by uh, Father Alexander Schmemann of the Eastern Orthodox Church. If anybody uh, wants this book, they can contact me after and I'll uh, be happy to provide it. But without uh, ado, we'll just get into it. So in today's society, there's kind of been this isolation of religious life and material life. We, we've created something called, sorry, we've created something called uh, like a spiritual life and then we have our other life that is our non-spiritual life and we've we've made it so that there's spiritual things and they're good and we accept them and they're seen as healing and helping us grow and then there's non-spiritual things um, and just to think of it like we say okay you know prayer is spiritual so prayer is good and prayer is part of my spiritual life but you know work is work and it's just what I use to make money and survive so work isn't really part of the, the spiritual side. And we kind of create two dichotomies of things that are good and things that are spiritual and things that are bad and things that are profane. We look at like food, I just eat to survive so then I can go back and I can do my prayers and I can go to liturgy and I can read my Bible. And I, I just use those material things to keep me going for the spiritual things. And if you don't believe me, um, I'll just tell you a story from my own personal life. So, Right now, I work as a lawyer, but before I worked as a lawyer, I had uh, a number of different jobs. We all do those random jobs in university. And in my third year of university, I started working for the um, RCMP um, for Indigenous Affairs. Sorry, I was working for Indigenous Affairs at that time, right after I was working for the RCMP. But when I was working at Indigenous Affairs, we all decided to go for a team lunch together. And... Uh, like it's like normal like we had a meeting we went for a team lunch and everybody's um, ordering their uh, meal and they're ordering their drinks so the waitress comes to me and she's like you know um, what are you gonna have to drink and everybody's ordering like a glass of wine with their drinks of beer or whatever so I said like yeah I'll have a glass of wine with my meal and everybody was super shocked because like you know like there's one massive gasp as I said I'll have this glass of wine the whole room was like oh, and they couldn't really believe it and I was so confused I was I didn't know what was happening and they they said like you know we just thought you you don't drink anything because you know you're training to become a priest and I said what like what are you guys talking about they're like you know when we went to hire you we went on your Facebook profile and we saw this photo or uh, her name was Katie or Katie saw this photo and it was you training to become a priest and I went and I tracked down how they found that out and I went office to office and I was like, hey, did you see the photo? Did you see the photo? Who saw the photo? Like, you know, it was Katie. Katie's the one who showed it to all of us. And uh, I gave you a glimpse at the photo, but this is the photo they saw of Nina Abuna Anthony from Ottawa. And I was just 
like so devastated that they had somehow mixed my spiritual life at church with my material life at work and that the two things that I usually keep separate had mixed that I had to go and track down who exactly said um, that I was trained to be a priest or who got my spiritual life involved at work. Those things aren't supposed to be together. They're separate. I was, I was upset that that had happened because we have created this spiritual life and this non-spiritual life. But the, the thesis or the talk today is those two things aren't supposed to be separate. There's no separation between spiritual life and this kind of material life, but our whole life is meant to glorify Christ and to become um, spiritual no matter what we're doing. So that when I say that Christ died for the life of the world, what I'm actually saying is that Christ died just as much for this world that we're now currently in as he did for the world that is to come, as he did for the next world. Christ breathed life again into the world we're currently living in. And as a result, we're able to um, live in him and have communion with him in this life. And we're able to live spiritually in this life and have our whole lives be spiritual rather than just apportioning a section of our life to my, my spiritual life and the rest is just the rest of my life. And we can really see this and taking the world and living spiritually um, with, in communion with God at the story of creation. Um, it starts all in creation. And as you know, the story of Adam and Eve, a lot of it has to do with hunger. Like God creates all the animals, God creates the, the trees. And there's this, there's this focus on food, like um, from an actual like physical perspective, you eat from this tree, you don't eat from that tree, you don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but also metaphorically, there is this focus on their hungry for, for something more than food. They're hungry for God as they dwell in communion with him. And all that exists in that garden, God has created as a gift for Adam and Eve. And we see Adam living um, in a very different way with God's gift in, in a sort of communion with it as we say he's a priest. He takes what God has given him and he offers it back to God um, as a type of offering, no matter what that be. Um, like, for example, if you go to Tezbeha, you probably know the third host. And there's a, like Tezbeha every Wednesday and Saturday. But when we're looking at the, the third host, there, it says like, bless the Lord, O sun and moon, praise him and exalt him above all forever. Bless the Lord, O stars of heaven, praise him and exalt him above all forever. But then when we get to the verse about men, it's, it's really different. It says, bless the Lord, O you sons of men, worship the Lord. That, that word worship, there's a type of different interaction between man and God. And when I say man, obviously I mean man and woman. Um, but there's a different interaction between man and God than the rest of the creation. The creation is just blessing God um, by its nature of being. But man has a physical act in which... Uh, he actually blesses God. Man has to do something when he's blessing God, whether it be physically or spiritually, but it's not just by being that man is blessing God. He is to an extent, but it says, bless the Lord, all you sons of men, worship the Lord. There's an action there of worshiping that man in his interactions with the creation glorifies and worships and blesses this creator. And that's what I'm saying. Adam was priest because Adam did that exact thing where he took what he received from God, the material things, and he offered it back to God to make his entire life um, Eucharist with God while he was in the garden. Um, and then we know the fall happens. But the world was created as this like matter, and it, but the matter is one all-embracing Eucharist. The matter is supposed to be something I take and I offer back to God, just as it was in the garden that Adam offered back to God as a priest. We're all called to be priests and to offer back to God. And the world even still understands this to some extent that although something is material, it can still be very spiritual. And you think about, um, again, food. Whenever we have a wedding, like when you have a wedding, you always have to have the, the best food there is. Um, and it's always like, oh, we need to feed everybody. We need to make sure everybody's full and they've enjoyed the food. Um, when you have a funeral, again, a big focus is, oh, we need food after the funeral service because there's something inherently spiritual that we gather around a meal. Even just thinking about, I know it was Thanksgiving for the Americans, but there's something more to gathering around a meal that we really respect. Um, up until like recently when families would like sit down and gather together for dinner, 
there was also a spiritual component to that where uh, it wasn't only about the meal, but the things that took place around the meal and eating the meal um, was something that that's sacred, which is why we've reserved it to, oh, we always need to have good foods at all these spiritual events, whether it be weddings, funerals, baptisms, and um, even to the extent where a philosopher in the 16th century, uh, Fjordbeck, he says, you are what you eat. Like before we know anything about science and how it takes this, um, your food and it transforms it into your cells or whatever, I, I'm not a scientist clearly, but before we know anything about that, he says you are what you eat because there's some sort of spiritual component associated with food as much as there is physical. And the same way in which God is blessed and man communes with him is also how we end up falling away with him. The same way that he gave us this food and we're supposed to offer it back to him is the same way that we, Adam, uh, fall away from him and we continue to fall away from him up to this this day. We take the gifts that he's offered us and instead of offering the gifts back to God, we um, use them and we become slaves to them. When you think of Adam, instead of offering back to God what God had given him, he instead decided to uh, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and become a slave to it. So the original sin, as much as the original sin is uh, eating of the tree and disobedience, it's also um, having fallen away and ceasing to be hungry for God. Before you were hungry for God, you offered everything back to him that he gave you, but then you cease to be that hunger. And in return or in causation to that, you then became a slave to the thing you were supposed to offer back to God. Even looking at um, medicine to some extent, there's always, um, you go to the doctor and you have pain and he can offer you some sort of medicine, morphine or whatever it might be. And it has a good purpose behind it. But if one becomes addicted to it and abuses it, you could fall to the, the point where you become a slave to that drug that was meant to help you. Um, likewise, Adam had something good that he was supposed to offer back to God, um, but he disobeyed God. And in, in, uh, in doing that, he became a sin to the very material things he was meant to offer back to God. But then God doesn't leave man in exile. Instead, he descends to show us what the hunger we were really craving is that thing inside of us that was missing and that we were looking for, he came to, to show us that that is him. Um, and you can see this in the story of the Samaritan woman. Christ goes out of his way to meet with the Samaritan woman at the well. And we know she was at the well at noon trying to get water because she didn't want to be seen by anybody in the village because she was um, to some extent or a great extent an outcast. Um, she didn't want to be seen by anybody, so she goes to the well, and Christ, meet, Christ meets her there at noon. And Christ is telling her, like, you know, you can have this everlasting water that will never make you thirst again. And she's really curious, but her curiosity isn't really from a, a spiritual perspective at first. It's, okay, like, I, I don't want to come back to this well. Like, if I don't have to see people, if I don't have to leave my house, like, I don't want to go back to the well. Tell me how I can have that water so I don't have to come back here ever again. It's not, she doesn't understand yet that, oh, he's talking about himself. He has to reveal it to her. But she's very much looking for something that's kind of like a cult. Uh, like, like, what do I have to do in order to have this water? What are the exact steps? Like, tell me X, Y, and Z, I'll do it. And then I never have to come back here. I never have to see anybody again. She's looking for something that's like a ritual, very very cult-like, but then Christ tells her, like, the, the whole thing has changed. He is, he, he tells her that he's the, the water that she's searching for, and that in doing that, he breaks down this, this ideology of there being any type of cult. Nowhere in the, the New Testament is Christianity presented as a cult or the same as the old religions or even as a, a religion itself, quote-unquote, that they used to have, because Religion is needed where there is a wall of separation between God and man. But Christ, who is both God and man, coming down in the flesh, breaks down the wall that was between God and man, and he inaugurates a new life. Um, and the Father Alexander Schmemann says he inaugurates a new life, not a new religion. Not, to, not for anybody to quote me and say, like Matthew saying, religion is unnecessary or anything like that. It's just that religion in the old days is very focused on um, formulas and cults and this is exactly what you need to do to have this outcome it's not really a relationship 
up until Christ comes and he tears down this wall and we are now able to interact with him. Um, and there's just this quote, it says, it was this freedom of the early church from religion in the usual traditional sense of this word that led the pagans to accuse Christians of atheism. Christians had no concern for any sacred geography, no temples, no cult that could be recognized as such by the generations fed with the psalmities of the mystery cults. There was no specific religious interest in the places where Jesus had lived. There were no pilgrimages. Like just, just in the sense to take that quote, what he's really trying to say is um, Christianity and a relationship with Christ is found anywhere the altar was found. It wasn't like, hey, you have to go to this specific geographical region every year and do some certain type of ritual in order to have a relationship with God. It wasn't God requires you to do X, Y, and Z, and then he's going to free you and save you. It was the altar is wherever the congregation has gathered um, and the, up into the point where um, liturgies are taking place in people's houses and the altars are found in people's houses in the early church. So it's not you have to go to this specific region or you have to take these specific steps or do, do anything um, exactly in some sort of formula in order to have a relationship with God. It's you are now able to communicate with God because God himself took your flesh and blessed it and has reconnected you to him once more. So you're now able to experience this world in a very different way, in a way where you're interacting with God and returning to that original priesthood that we were talking about, where you can take this world and offer it right back to God. And to do that, to take the world and offer it back to God, to live a life um, where you have a relationship with God is really to live a life in communion. And I'm going to say Eucharist, to live a life in Eucharist. And when I refer to that, I'm referring to um, just living a life in communion with God. But also, I'm going to start talking about Eucharist in the sacramental sense. So if we're talking about communion with God, really there's no better place to start than to start with communion itself, with the sacrament of the Eucharist. We're promised this, this joy on earth, but when we're promised this joy, it's got to be more than a feeling. If Christ says, you know, enter into the joy of your Lord, like how do you enter into something that's just a feeling? It has to be something that's more than a feeling. And we have no other means of understanding this entrance into joy except through the one action that from the beginning of the church has been both the source and fulfillment of joy, and that's the very sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And when we think about Eucharist, we always, we tend to think of just the end of the liturgy, but we really have to start focusing more on the liturgy as a whole, as being more of a journey or a procession. And this journey or this procession isn't just um, something that takes place at the end of the liturgy when we, when we get the communion finally and we get the body and blood of Christ, but it's throughout the whole liturgy, and it's an entrance into this dimension of the kingdom. And I'm using the word dimension just because it seems like the best way to indicate the manner of this sacramental entrance into the risen life of Christ in, in liturgy. And I'm going to tell you a story. When I was uh, last year an articling student with um, Intact Insurance, who is the company I currently work for, but as an articling student, you're being trained by the lawyers. So typically you just do what the lawyers say. Um, like that's your role. You're the trainee. If the lawyer tells you to do something, whether it's related or not related, you try and do it because you want to make a good impression and get hired back. So one lawyer was um, having an art exhibit. She, her artwork was, uh, was chosen to be in some sort of exhibit and you can go and you can bid on it. And she said, hey guys, can you come to the art exhibit? Uh, and I said, yeah, sure. Like I'd love to, but you know, I don't want to see your art drawings before I get to the exhibit because if I see them before and then I go to the exhibit, what's the point? It's going to be the exact same thing. And one day we were uh, sitting downstairs at lunch and I accidentally saw the exhibit on her phone because she was just passing them around. And I looked at it and I was like, well, like, is this the thing that's going to be at the exhibit? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, I didn't want to see this because now what's the point? Why am I going to the exhibit if I've already seen the art on your phone? It just I'm just doing it to please her at this point. But still, I had to go to the exhibit because I'm the articling student. So I went and I looked at her artwork. And when I got there, 
it was so different than the art on the phone because you don't you can't see the dimensions on the phone but when artists are painting she paints like 20 layers so that when i'm looking at a mountain the mountain's popping out when i'm looking at um, a building the building pops out and the windows are somehow indented so that the, the art on the phone is not comparable to the art that was in the exhibit at, at all the exhibit was such a greater experience and just keep that story in the back of your mind and we'll come back to it in just momentarily but um and i promise it will it will all link and make sense in a couple of minutes but the early christians realized that in order to become the temple of the Holy Spirit, in order to have this, this world in a, in, in a spiritual life, in order to experience this world through Christ, they had to ascend to heaven where Christ had ascended in the liturgy. Um, we think of liturgy so often as just, we're just here at liturgy, it's in the church, but we don't realize that there's actually an ascension going on into heaven uh, when we're at liturgy there's there's an ascension into this other dimension and in english we have one word for time and i think i've said this a couple of times to some people but in english the word for time is time like we don't have another word for time but in uh greek they have two words for time they have kairos and they have uh, chronos kairos being well let's start with chronos because it's the one you and i know and it's the easiest to explain chronos being the chronological order of time you and I are both considered to live in Kronos. It's, there's a point here and there's a point here. And you experience life through these different points. That's known as Kronos. You can't jump five minutes back and you can't jump five minutes into the future. But Kairos is what God dwells in. What the saints, we uh, say they dwell in now. It's outside of this line of Kronos is Kairos, where you can experience all these different points of time because you are outside of time itself so we say god is in um kairos and we say the church at liturgy is also in that time of kairos which is why when someone dies we can pray for them the day they die but also we can pray for them 40 years after they die and it's as though we prayed for them on the day they died because we are outside of time itself it's why um that praying for them 40 years later is the same as praying them for them uh, on the day they die. And where do we see this? Um, we see it throughout the liturgy. We see, um, we see like throughout the liturgy, the priest says things or he, he chants things that indicate that we are no longer wrapped up with this earth. We are no longer in this Kronos time. Like when the priest says, for you are the, the hope of us all, the healing of us all, the hope of us all, the thing of us all, the something of us all, and the resurrection of us all, okay? But like, how are you the resurrection of us all when we haven't died and risen yet? Or how does he say um, in the Liturgy of the Faithful, he says, we commemorate your crucifixion, your death, your ascension into the heavens, and your second coming awesome and full of glory. Uh, in order to commemorate something, it's like I'm commemorating it already happened. How am I commemorating his second coming when that's still something to come according to what i know so the priest is always indicating you're no longer in this chronological timeline you are in this uh, other dimension of kairos you are in this dimension with god outside of this earthly time itself so there's truly a journey or a procession into this dimension of the kingdom when i am in liturgy and then the liturgy ends and you come back to this point of um of it's your turn to go and spread the word like why why when moses comes down from mount tabor do people realize that moses has been interacting with god what's different about moses now it's not that moses is out there telling everybody hey i just interacted with god or hey you should have seen it i saw god when i was on mount tabor it's that his face is shining and it's bright and it's radiant and he doesn't need to say anything for you to know that Moses had interacted with God. It's just known by his face and the brightness of his face. And the priest tells us at the end of liturgy, go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you. The go in peace is a commandment. Go in peace. Um, like it's your turn to now spread what you've seen and 
and to experience the world differently. You, before you had come to liturgy, before you had known Christ, you were, you were experiencing the world as I was looking at the artwork on You've seen exactly what it's meant to be. You've entered the art exhibit. You've seen the art for what it truly is. You can now experience that differently and you can experience the world differently because you have entered into this dimension of, of the kingdom with Christ. Because you can now experience life with Christ. You have tasted him. You have participated with him and received him in the Eucharist. Now you go into the world and you spread Christ through this new experience, through living a spiritual life all in all, all, not just having this one section of your life being spiritual and the, the rest of your life being material and separating to the two. No, your whole life is now meant to be a spiritual life because you have tasted Christ. You're supposed to be as Moses and your face should be shining when people see you. Maybe not shining um, like literally, but shining in the sense of my acts, my works, my love that I show people is so radically different because of what I've experienced that people say, hey, there's something different about him. He has experienced God. And even to, to go further and to tell you, like, you're truly with Christ and outside of time when you are at liturgy, like, why do we kiss the priest's hand? Like, why do we kiss the priest's hand? A lot of people are going to tell you, you know, we kiss the priest's hand because the, priest, the priest's hand touched the body in, of Christ. Like, that's... The, that's not the, the true answer as to why we started kissing the priest's hand. Like, sure, it's good. The priest's hand touches, touches the body of Christ. But more so, the priest's hands are the hands of Christ. Because when we celebrate the Eucharist at the liturgy, when the priest says, take eat of this, all of you, for this is my body, that is Christ saying, this is my body. The priest becomes Christ in that moment. And it's not like we're just recreating the Last Supper. We are at the, the supper and Christ is giving us the Eucharist. The priest says, this is my body. That's Christ speaking. So when I run to kiss a priest's hand, I'm not running to kiss Abuna Kiro's hand because Abuna Kiro is so holy and he's touched Christ. I'm running to kiss the hands of Christ himself because those hands have been transformed to Christ's hands in the liturgy. It's the, it's the blessing of kissing Christ's hands that I'm really going after. And we really don't realize this. We, we think of the liturgy so much as, liter as, as theater. We just think like, oh, you know, deacons will stand up there and they'll look to what's the next part that I'm supposed to say in the liturgy. And when's my line? And it's kind of like this big play, like this production. I don't know. I, I've recently watched Hamilton and I really liked it, but it's like, we think of it as like a musical theater show where everybody has their lines and everybody know like this, you're supposed to say this and you're supposed to say that. And if we do it right, it will all be smooth. But really, there's no theater behind the liturgy. It is these actual um, Last Supper taking place. It's the actual Christ. It's, uh, it's the actual offering. And it's not just some sort of theater. We are truly present, and Christ is truly present with us on that altar. And then having experienced that, like I said, we come back into the world. We're commanded, go in peace. And now we experience the world differently because we have been lifted into this alternate dimension of, of Kairos and having um, experienced that we can now spread that to the world and they realize that there's something truly truly different about us and it's like now we know when we discuss liturgy it's not just that we're discussing like this bread and wine becoming the body and blood and that's the end all be all something happens to the bread and wine in liturgies it it happens to that bread and wine because something first happens to all of us because the church because each one of us uh, accepts Christ and lifts up ourselves into the kingdom, into the kingdom of Christ, and we are standing beyond space and time. That's why the priest says, um, lift up your hearts, and we say, like, you know, we have them with the world, uh, with the Lord, or in some translations, they are lifted up with the Lord. Like, what do you mean they're lifted up? I just told you to lift them up. Like, they're already there because we are present with Christ um, in a space beyond time and space in a heavenly realm. So. Truly, something happens to the bread and wine becoming body and blood because first something has happened to us. And then we discuss this. Um, this is a quote just that Father Alexander Schmemann says, and it really touched me concerning liturgy. He says, We go to church so that this divine love will again and again be poured into our hearts, so that again and again 
and we may put on love. So that constituting the body of Christ, we can abide in Christ's love and manifest it in the world. But that is why our contemporary, utterly individualized piety, in which we egotistically separate ourselves from the gathering, is so grievous, so contradictory to the age-old experience of the church. Even while standing in the church, we continue to sense some people as neighbors and others as strangers. A faceless mass that has no relevance to us and to our prayer and distributes and disturbs our spiritual concentration. So he's basically saying like, we're so individualized in church nowadays where, you know, especially like I hear a lot of people saying like, I don't like Sunday liturgies. It's so crowded. So I go on Saturdays or I go on Wednesday mornings because it's a lot less crowded, but everybody in that liturgy is there to praise Christ and rise with you into this, this new dimension. Like it's, it's the body of Christ being raised. It's the body of Christ performing the sacrament and not just you by yourself are here to praise. We're all called to praise together in unison to the point where there's no stranger in the liturgy. Sure. I don't know somebody like I haven't met them before, but that person shouldn't be a stranger to me. That person's a brother in Christ and me and him are praising Christ and lifting up ourselves together to Christ or that person's my sister in Christ and we are lifting ourselves up together. So he's just really saying like, we shouldn't be so individualized because it truly is a group activity. Uh, it truly is a moment for Kononia. And then we see this, if you recall, we were talking about, and hopefully I'm not going over time, but um, we see this throughout all the sacraments, we were talking about how there's no material and spiritual, but our whole life is called to take the material and offer it back to God and become priests and live a spiritual life in completion. We see this in all the sacraments, whether it be um, chrismation, we take the oil and we, we anoint ourselves and we offer that back to God, but also in uh, the crowning ceremony, the marriage ceremony known as the crowning, this is the most, the most, um, like sac it's the easiest place to see this idea of the kingdom of God coming down in our lives um, and a material thing being offered to God and living a spiritual life. And, and what do I mean by that? So in the crowning ceremony, the kingdom of God is present because we see this kingdom being made on earth that's meant to represent the kingdom of God or be an extension of the kingdom of God in the family unit. Um, we have three big titles for Christ. We say Christ is prophet. We say Christ is priest. We say Christ is king. And in marriage, then we say that like there's the fullness of this kingdom and the fullness of Christ in a sense where man is called to be priest in that he leads the family spiritually and he's called to be king in that also he takes like a a decision role or a leadership role in the family. But then we say that the, the wife is meant to be like prophet and that she, she advises and she rationales because um, that's what the role of the prophet was in the Old Testament. Um, so there's this completion of what Christ is in marriage and what the kingdom of God is in marriage, um, where, where we say Christ is prophet, king, and priest. And between the husband and wife, we see these titles being divided so that we see the fullness of the kingdom even in marriage itself to the point where just as God is able to produce and bring forth love out of the, uh, bring forth life out of the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and the creation story, we see God grant that ability to the husband and wife to bring forth life through their own love. So truly, the kingdom of God is extended in the marriage itself. So it's just another form where we see there's no material and no spiritual, but the, entire, the entirety of life becomes spiritual when you have communion with Christ, when you take what Christ has given you and when you offer it back to him to, to truly bless all that you have and to, to communion with him and everything. Um, and then to do this, to, to live a life, of, a life of communion with Christ, because that's what our focus is on today, like how, what's the first step? Well, I think we know the first step is baptism. We talked about liturgy, but, but truly like in today's world, um, we have a fear of death and religion becomes this thing that's kind of meant as a helper to the problem of, of death. Religion is just meant to like, oh, like which religion do I like that gives me a solution to death? Like, do I like reincarnation? Do I like, I don't know, like there's no afterlife and whatever you decide that you like, like you'll choose that religion because 
uh, a lot of people are just looking for an answer to what they're scared of, and it's death. And Christianity is completely opposite to every other religion in that we don't really have uh, a, a solution for death in the sense because we uh, truly embrace death in baptism. We, we are dead to the world when we are baptized to the point like there was like a Tessonian baptism one time and there was uh, a lady not from the Coptic church there and like she was saying, oh, this is so torturous. Like how are you guys dunking that baby and that baby can't breathe and what are you doing? You're going to kill the baby. And like, the Tassoni was like, no, we're not going to kill the baby. We are killing the baby. That baby is now dead to the world because when we are baptized, we become dead onto the world and we, we rise with him. Like if you want to live with him, you have to also die with him um, in order to resurrect with him. So we become dead to the world because we understand that the world as it currently is, isn't the, the state it's supposed to be in. And I know that kind of like, contradicts what I've been saying that Christ died for the life of this world but we can only experience what this world is actually supposed to be when we die and we rise with him and we are able to then partake of the world through him through having a relationship with him through having communion with him through being able to go to the liturgy and participate so it's not until you and I decide to die to the world that we actually get to experience the fullness of this life the fullness of being in communion with Christ and having our whole lives be um, a spiritual life because in him the death the death and the dying itself becomes an act of life in Christ when I die um, it's actually an act of life because he's fulfilled that death and risen uh, and resurrected and allowed me now to resurrect with him so even in that there is joy and peace and all of the troubles of this world become um, become seen through the lens of the resurrection and through the lens of knowing him and um, having a relationship with him. So to conclude, if there's a possibility to see and to live for the world to come in, in this world, if there's a possibility to, to know him and to have communion with him in this world, um, not just to experience this world as something like uh, besides the fact to my spiritual life, but to experience this world um, as a gift from God and a blessing from God and to be able to then offer it back to him. If I have this opportunity to have communion with him in all aspects of my life, why am I waiting? Like, why do people say like, you know, I can't wait to, to see Christ in, uh, when I depart. Like, you can see Christ right now um, through communion, through knowing him, through having an active relationship with Christ. And if St. Paul says to us also, like, pray unceasingly, it's truly, I'm supposed to have an aspect with him and, uh, or a relationship with him in everything that I do. He doesn't say like, just like pray sometimes or just pray at night before you sleep or just pray in the morning when you wake up. It's pray unceasingly. My meals become prayer. My meals become an opportunity for me to have an interaction with God. My work becomes an opportunity for me to glorify the creator. And my relationships with other people become seeds that I'm able to sow for the glory of the creator, because my whole life is dedicated to him and only experienced through him. Because just like Moses went up on that mountain and he interacted with God and he came down and you could see that his face was shining and that he had interacted with God through what you saw, but not through his words. So too, am I now called to experience God in the Eucharist, in the sacraments, in my own life, and then to be able to come down from that Mount Tabor that I've been to and to have everybody recognize that I too have experienced Christ, that there too is something different about me that you might no not notice in the other person because they have yet to experience what I have experienced. And you had known Moses had met God and it wasn't because he had said anything, but because of what you saw. And then I'll just leave you with two things. The first is a quote. Um, because I never want to end on my own knowledge because my own knowledge is so limited. But the world as man's food is not something material and limited to material functions, thus different from and opposed to the specifically spiritual functions by which man is related to God. All that exists is, God, all that exists is God's gift to man and it all exists to make God known to man, to make man's life communion with God. He's everything that 
exists is known for me and you to be able to bless and praise and to have communion with God. We just have to utilize it as he, as he sees fit in our lives. And then the last thing I leave you with is um, this icon that I saw a couple of years ago, and I think about it at least once a week. It's probably the most powerful icon I've ever seen. I'll just describe it because um, I'm guessing if people are listening to this, they won't be able to see the icon. But the icon is taken uh, at an Eastern Orthodox church. That's where it was drawn. That's where this picture is taken. But um, in the icon, you can see a couple of the apostles. And then there's this empty outline, like shadow shape, where nobody is standing. And you see Judas exiting the Last Supper. And his body could kind of fit into that um, shadow. I forget what the, the word is for shadow, but um, he could, that, uh, that shadow is where Judas's body could go. However, he's outside of the, the, the halo and the sainthood. And this icon is called what Judas lost. So he was like, it's meant to say that he could have been counted with the rest of the apostles. Um, yet, because he gave in and became a slave to the material, he became a slave to money, um, he lost his sainthood. Um, so it just goes to say, like, we have this opportunity for sainthood, you and me, and we have this opportunity to, to um, live saintly lives and to live in communion with Christ, but this falters or this can change if we decide to become um, slaves to the material, if we decide to leave what we were called to because we um, would rather try and find some um, joy, quote unquote joy, in some other form. So it's just, are you going to take what Christ is offering you? Are you going to take the sainthood that he's offering you and live your life in a way that blesses him and glorifies him? Or are you going to um, put other things above him? So that's all I had to say today. And glory be to God for everyone. Else. Amen. I have a couple of questions that uh, Tara had told me to prepare. So if, um, do we have time for questions? Yes, go ahead, Jamat. Um, I, I'm just checking here. What's our participants? Oh, okay, we have participants. <laughs> it's not just me and you anymore. <laughs> no, we have participants, so you can go ahead and ask them. <laughs> I was uh, just going to say, if you can still see the screen, okay. So we know that we're called to experience the world differently as Christians, uh, but my question is, like, what's preventing us and how do we overcome those hurdles? That was the, the first question I want to put out there. And if nobody has an answer, I guess I'll start. Okay, I'll, I'll just speak to it, I guess. But um, if what's preventing us from experiencing this world in communion with Christ, or what's, what's preventing us from, sorry, offering back to him? Um, for myself personally, I think false promises of joy and becoming a slave to the material in 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 other aspects, like even social media to some extent, you see pictures of people doing things and they look happy or they look fulfilled or they look like joy and you start to question like, oh, am I, am I gay? Can I also get that joy that people show on social media through doing certain things? Um, so I think there's a lot of fake joy surrounding us or, or joy that's not really fulfilling or, or rooted in Christ. It's not real joy. It's not the joy of Christ. And I think just surrounding ourselves with social media where everybody claims to be living according to materials or a slave to material things and joyful is, is a hurdle for me. And I was thinking, how do you overcome those things? I guess it's turning off social media to some extent, which I try to do, but I struggle with. Um, and just recognizing that true joy is in, in Christ himself. Um, that was my thing that I think is a hurdle. If anybody or anybody has anything else feel free to share i think if we know christ right then we can overcome and like if we taste him and if we know get to know him truly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, the thing, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. That has been an amazing ride for me personally. I don't know about uh, anyone else, but sorry, I cannot be on camera just because I'm driving right this moment. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, but um, um, I, um, I think we do experience Christ. And, and God does not leave himself without the witness, without revealing himself one way or another at some point in our lives. I think that many times we expect him to always be that amazing hero all the times and revealing himself in magnificent, amazing way all the times. But many saints live all their lives because they experience just one of those uh, moments of revelations. Uh, I don't know, Matthew, if you want to comment on this. Um, sure, you're putting me on the spot somewhat, but it reminds me of, uh, I was re reading recently on the life of Mother Teresa, and um, in her letters, she, she had experienced Christ and she had... Um, she had you know committed to serving christ and serving her brothers and sisters the poor and at the end of her life she was really struggling to feel god she was doing all of this and serving god so much but she didn't um she wasn't feeling him she was struggling she said she says like she couldn't feel his presence and there was a point where the pope had passed away um i'm forgetting the exact pope right now but uh, the Pope had passed away and she was attending the Pope's funeral, the Catholic Pope's funeral. And she prayed like, God, just let me experience your presence. And she says she experienced it after that funeral, but five weeks later, she no longer experienced the God. So for, from the time of her going to serve the poor and taking on that mission up to 50 years later uh, and her death, the total time that she actually experiences God is five weeks um, from that Pope's death to the five weeks where she says, I no longer saw experiencing him. So it wasn't just like these feelings that were gushing out of her and everything felt good. So she decided to continue um, pursuing God, but she had felt something at some point to make her want to serve Christ, even if at that exact moment she struggled to feel, uh, feel his presence. She knew that he was out there and she was um, truly trying to make a connection with him. And just, there's also one guy, uh, his name's Philo Young. He's a convert, but he was talking to us one time and he said like, he was saying, he walked into the Coptic church and he I told the priest like, I need to know if this religion's right. And the priest told him like, you know, like this, like Coptic, to be Coptic is pretty hard. Like, you know, there's fasting and like we don't do certain things and it's not like it's easy to be Coptic and he said like you know I don't care if it's hard if it's hard and it's the truth then I have to follow it um like like if it's hard and it's a lie that's a different thing but but just because I don't feel something or just because I don't like the way something is doesn't mean that that is not the truth that that is not what my life is meant to reflect so I guess what I'm saying is yeah there's going to be difficult times and there's going to be times when I won't necessarily feel Christ, or I won't feel like um, this overwhelming sense of spirituality that I felt one time when I was praying, but knowing that his existence is there and that his love for me is there and that he died for me, and knowing what I have felt in the past should be enough to carry me through um, my present days of pain or my present days of whatever I might be struggling with. Is that sufficient, of Luna? Thank you, Matthew. That's well put. See, I told you, uh, we agree on things, but you make uh, a lot better argument. A lot better argument than mine, which is very good. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the last thing I want to put to everybody is um, what's my role in helping others experience the love of Christ and how do I fulfill that role? And if I think I mentioned it throughout my presentation when I talked about Moses, but if anybody has any ideas, they can share them. If not, I guess I'll speak to it again. 
Uh, Irene has her hand up. Oh, sorry, I can't see hands. Yeah, it's Irene. okay. Yeah, but that's not related to this question, so I'll go after you answer this question. Um, no, go ahead now. It's okay. There's there's no order to anything. Uh, but okay, but it's gonna be off topic. Okay. That, that's that's fine. We can go off topic. Okay, so I just wanted to really say thank you, Matthew, for this talk. I mean, I've heard talks about how Christ is, you know, um, like the bread of life and all these topics you kind of covered, but never from this perspective. Um, it really kind of made me shift my perspective altogether. Um, and you found a way to phrase it about how being in liturgy, um, we step outside, outside of time. You know, um, I think that's a really important concept that many of us don't really think about or don't realize. So um, I'm glad that you highlighted that. And maybe I'm wrong, um, Abuna can correct me. I think it's not only liturgy, but I think, of course, liturgy is the biggest one, but I think it could also be other um, prayer services too, uh, whether it's tezbeha or other things too. Um, and also I wanted to say thank you, Matthew, for um, just highlighting different things. Again, you just forced me to think about so many aspects that are so familiar and you made me think about them from a completely different direction. So now I'm looking at them differently. Like uh, the Tazbiha example, um, you know, of course I know that line about um, worship the Lord, but it never hit me that, <laughs> you know, humans, that's what it's saying. Humans have to do something different than the rest of creation. You know, I never really thought of it that way. Right. So I just wanted to say thanks for that. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Thank you. You, um, yeah, thanks. I'm glad that Christ speaks through me in some, to some extent. And, uh, yeah, I have nothing more to say, but, uh, yeah. Just, you can move to the next question. Matthew. Yeah. Just touching on, uh, what I was speaking to, if anybody wants to discuss um, what is my role in helping others experience the love of Christ and how do I fulfill that role, I'll leave it open to you. If not, I'll, I'll speak about it. Okay, so I guess I'll start by giving my perspective, but as we were discussing Moses who went up on Mount Tabor and he came down and he, we could tell that he experienced God by his, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, excuse me. Uh, we could tell that he experienced God by his shining face. And I was, I was kind of alluding to it the entire time that you and I are also supposed to have these shining faces in our actions and in our uh, interactions with people in the way that we handle our work um, in the way that everything we do is done with love because we're experiencing everything through Christ, through knowing Christ, through having communion with him. People should be able to look at that and say, the way that this person is experiencing the world is totally different than the way another individual may be um, experiencing the world. And there's a quote from, I think it's attributed to C.S. Lewis, but um, don't hold me to that. But it says, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. That's the quote. Preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. As if to say my actions should be enough to preach the gospel because when I act, people see the, uh, the gospel being lived out. When I'm doing whatever, whether, when I'm eating, when I'm having a conversation with friends, uh, I, people see the gospel is there. People see Christ is truly present. And there's no need for me to tell you that Christ is present. There's no need for me to tell you that I live according to the death and in the, in the resurrection of Christ because you just are able to know that through interacting with me. So it was preach the gospel and if necessary use words. And I think that's my role um, of, of um, being an experience of the love of Christ in another person's life. My role is just to give them all the love that Christ has offered to me so that they might know him who is love. That's my take on it. Thank you so much, Matthew. Amazing. Okay. Thank, thank you, Matt. Um, if
if I uh, just um, extend a little bit on uh, on that, um, uh, our lives. Um, it hits me a lot when we say, you know, yeah, the book uh, you, you're using for the life of the world, right? And that part, that part uh, comes at the beginning of the institution narrative in the liturgy, right? Uh, Hain instituted for us this great mystery of godliness for being determined, for being determined to give himself for the life of the world. And I think in the liturgy, we also become, um, we, we are united to Christ, and, and we are the body of Christ. So we are also giving ourselves for the life of the world. Uh, for those, of course, who believe and, and who may come uh, to see the light and who come to the true light, the knowledge of the true light. So... Um, it's kind of like uh, just as Christ making himself available to us and uh, partaking of his um, body, um, we need also to be uh, making ourselves available to the world to taste, to taste uh, Christ uh, through us in the same manner. So I would kind of like imagine like uh, the body of the whole church is like a one big, if you want to call it, like a one big urbana, right? In the whole world, right? And uh, the world is is gathered uh, around it. So if if each one of us carry um, carries our parts and and live uh, that life of Christ uh, to give up ourselves for the world. Um, definitely this, uh, one big body, uh, or you want to put like a one big, uh, huge urbana round, uh, is covering the whole world. Um, everyone will gather around Christ. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think one of the themes that we're looking for, probably for the next year, um, we were talking about that, like closing the gap between Sunday, Monday uh, thing, um, where Sunday after the liturgy, I'm getting ready to start my uh, week Monday and uh, go through a cycle to try to come back on Sunday, a different life, like how you started the talk. So there is a need to close that gap. Have you ever heard of that term? Um, what what term? I I hear the they saying close the gap, but what term specifically? Yeah, they say uh, closing the gap, uh, Sunday Monday gap. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, like you, know, we we always flip between Sunday and uh, right after Sunday, like you said, like you flip, uh, kind of like the switch to Monday mode. Right until next Sunday, mm -hmm. <laughs> come back again. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I wish we can extend this uh, further. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll leave that to Mariam if we can extend that uh, in weeks to come or in how we can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will say Tuck corrected me and the quote wasn't C.S. Lewis, it was St. Francis of Assisi, who's a, a Catholic saint, so that I'm not misquoting here. I'll say it was attributed to him. Okay, very yeah. good.